was an idea. The Avengers initiative. I'm gonna do this all day. Remember? I'm a superhero. I come to bargain. I love you, please, Hansen. That's my secret, Cat. I'm always angry. You should have gone for the head. And I. Well, good enough, Emma! Why is Gamora? Iron Man. We are. And welcome to another edition of Marvel Standom. Our last interview from San Diego Comic-Con this year was with Matt Forbeck and CJ Cervantes, who collaborated on the new Marvel Multiverse role-playing game. In the game, you can play as an existing character or create your own in this action-packed tabletop. And you can also play it with friends. But before I turn it over to Mike, who conducted the interview, we've got a brief message on behalf of eBay, the sponsor of this episode. eBay is the premier destination for collecting comics both old and new. Whether it's that highly sought after iconic comic or an obscure niche that speaks directly to you, odds are you'll certainly find it on eBay. Here's the list of comics that are must haves for any fan of the Marvel multiverse. JLA Avengers 1. Marvel heroes have, on occasion, met up with characters from other universes, as when the Punisher dropped by Riverdale to mix it up with Archie and the gang. But none of these crossovers are as significant as the rare occasions when Marvel and DC Comics put aside their differences to collaborate. And the greatest of those combined works is JLA Avengers, a four-part series that saw the premier super teams fight, team up, and even combine to save their respective universes. Even more than the pure joy of seeing Darkseid wear the Infinity Gauntlet or Hawkeye shout at Green Arrow, JLA Avengers works because it has the ideal creative team. No one knows more about superheroes than Kurt Busiek, and no one did awesome group shots like artist George Perez, both of whom keep the story clear even when it's overstuffed with characters. Secret Wars 1 Easily the most epic multiversal story in Marvel history, Secret Wars tells a mind-bending story that changes the Marvel Universe forever. An extension of the Fantastic Four and Avengers stories written by Jonathan Hickman, Secret Wars takes place in a Marvel Universe recreated in the image of Doctor Doom. The only hope comes in a small band of heroes who remember the world as it once was, including Guardian of the Galaxy Star-Lord, Captain Marvel Carol Danvers, and of course, Reed Richards. But how can even these mighty heroes stand against Doom with godlike powers? The Amazing Spider-Man 9 Even with the MCU in the midst of its multiverse saga, the average superhero fan associates alternate realities with our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Shortly before Miles Morales asked what's up danger, the Spider-Verse appeared in a wonderful crossover spearheaded by writers Dan Slott and Christos Gage. When a vampiric figure called Morlan begins hunting spider people across infinite universes, the Peter Parker we know and love must team up with the other Spideys to save his life. The joy of the first Spider-Verse comics comes from seeing all the wacky variations of Peter and other webheads. Dan Slott's wonderful script for Amazing 9 features appearances by everyone from the Simeon Spider Monkey to Spider-Man 2099 Miguel O'Hara. Excalibur Special Edition As much as the Marvel Cinematic Universe is leaning into multiverse stories, the dirty secret is that the multiverse is more the domain of the distinguished competition. That changed not in the main US Marvel comics, but in the Captain Britain stories published by Marvel UK. Those adventures finally made it stateside with Excalibur, an X-Men spin-off. Introduced in a 1987 special called Excalibur Special Edition or Excalibur the Sword is Drawn, Excalibur brings mutants Shadow Cat, Nightcrawler and Rachel Summers to the UK, where they join up with Captain Britain Brian Braddock and his shape-shifting girlfriend Megan. Together, the group goes on some of the most strange and delightful adventures Marvel has to offer, including mysteries across the multiverse. Exiles 1 The joy of a multiverse story comes from seeing familiar characters in unfamiliar situations, like exploring all of the variations of Wolverine and Spider-Man. No series captured that joy better than 2001's Exiles from writer Judd Winnick. 
Set shortly after the events of the X-Men story Age of Apocalypse, Exiles follows a team of multiversal figures across alternate realities, encountering some of the strangest takes of the heroes we know and love. Unlike the edgier stories for which he's better known, Winnick takes a light-hearted approach to the team's adventures, aided by round, warm character work from penciler Mike McCone and inker Mark McKenna. Head on over to ebay.com today to start or expand your collection. And now, back to the show. What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Den of Geek studio. I am Mike Cicchini, and I am joined right now by two of the geniuses behind the Marvel Multiverse role-playing game, Mr. Matt Forbeck and Mr. CJ Cervantes. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about what you brought to this new Marvel tabletop RPG, and then we will get into some of the, the fun details in that rule book. Uh, well, I've been doing this stuff for a long time. I've been a full-time uh, game designer and novelist and comic book writer, video game writer for something like 30 years. I've started out doing original D&D stuff, but um, for this, I had written, I had been one of the designers in the previous edition of the game that Margaret Weiss came out with about 10 years ago, or 11 years ago. And in the interim, I had written two editions of the Marvel Encyclopedia. Uh, I've been reading, I learned how to read on Spider-Man comics when I was a kid, right? So, uh, so I, you know, John Nee was uh, the publisher of the company at the time, and I'd actually designed the Wildstorms collectible card game for Jim Lee's uh, division of Image Comics back when John was the vice president of that company. And we kept in touch over the years. So when he wanted to do this book, he's like, there's only one person I want to talk to. And it was me. So I'm like, well, and he actually, I posted about how excited I was to have this book in my hands. Finally, he says, you were born for this. I'm like, I don't know if that's true, but thank you. you know? <laughs> one of the really special things about this book and, and this game in particular for us is that superheroes genre, superhero games are, are, are different from a lot of the other games in the genre, right? And, and we really wanted people who are picking up this book and, and playing this game to feel super. Uh, and we feel that we've done a really good job with that with our dice mechanic, um, the D616, which is uh, proprietary to our game. Um, and we want it to be accessible for folks, but still have a little bit of that crunch for folks that really want to sink in. Uh, so we're really excited for people to, to pick up the game and, and just start diving in. Let's talk about this unique dice system for the game, the D616. I mean, so this is a game based entirely around D6 rolls, correct? But there's a little bit of a twist. So the D616 system is, you know, a lot of gamers would say, say 3D6, right? uses three six-sided dice, but the trick is that one of them is a special die. It's 616 for people who are Marvel fans. No, that's the Marvel Universe, Marvel comic book universe. But one of the dice is an off-color die. So you have two dice that are white and one's red, and the red die on the one, there's a Marvel logo, right? Now, you can use any dice you want to, you just have, as long as you can keep track of them and know that the one on the off-color die is your Marvel die. <clears throat> If you come up with that Marvel logo, that's a fantastic role. That means something exciting happens, right? And we kind of engineered this. Like if you're playing other games, you know, you might get a critical hit like 5% of the time, right? In our game, it's like triple or quadruple that, right? That's because superhero games are really about blockbuster moments and punching things out and knocking people through walls and flying at the speed of light. And you want to be able to replicate that with the dice. So uh, what you do is if you, that... Marvel die comes up, then something spectacular happens, either it's double damage or some kind of a special effect on your powers or whatever. And we also have the ability to use karma points to actually change the die roll. So if you roll uh, the dice and you're like, ah, oh, I didn't like that, I'm gonna use a karma point or I'm gonna use an edge that I have to re-roll one of the dice, just one of them, and then you take the better result. And you, you get some really fantastic, exciting moments in that. Yeah, part of it is having fun at the table. We, we understand, again, superheroes are fun. How can we make it accessible for folks who maybe this is their first tabletop role playing game that they're playing? I, I don't have a D20. Uh, uh, what, what is a D8? Is that, you know, like that sort of thing can be confusing and almost a little uh, daunting or challenging for new folks to the game. Uh, so as long as you have a set of Yahtzee, right, or, or literally any sort of die, we really want to make sure if you're uh, a new player to the space, new to TTRPGs, you can pick up our game. But if also if you're experienced, you have three D sixes laying around, um, so that it's just fun and accessible for folks. You can raid your Yahtzee box. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you specifically brought up how these, you know, if you roll correctly on your Marvel die, great things can happen. But the thing that always sets Marvel storytelling apart is the fact that these characters are flawed and they can fail. And so you also have. I believe the rule book even calls them fantastic failures, which I am very familiar with. So 
what does a fantastic failure bring to the storytelling and role-playing element of the game? Right. So, I mean, fantastic success, everybody's like, wow, that's awesome. I do double damage, whatever. But the trick is you can get the fantastic uh, results on the die and still screw up what you're trying to do, right? Because you have to roll against the target number. If you don't quite hit the target number, like I'm trying to punch the Hulk. It doesn't matter how well I roll. I'm probably going to screw it up anyway, right? Uh, but then if it's a fantastic failure, something really cool happens, right? We had one in the game I was running yesterday, and like the Hulk throws a bench at Spider-Man, and uh, it's a fantastic failure. I'm like, well, uh, what are you going to do? You know, well, the, the the entire wall behind Spider-Man crumbles, and he actually lands on the Hulk. It's the narrator's job or the player's job to come up with some ideas about how to do fun things out of that. It's one of those, uh, yes, but you you failed, but this is something cool. It's going to happen from that. So, right. So it's like looking into something. <laughs> Wait, wait, sorry, it look, it's looking bleak, but then suddenly, obviously, the superhero finds a way to, to stand out on top. And, and again, we wanted to make sure we captured that in our game. I like that you bring up the fact that you were talking about people who are playing as established Marvel characters, which this game gives you the opportunity to do, but it also allows you to create original characters. Uh, so in the course of designing the game, and especially in the course of playtesting, how did you strike that balance between, obviously people, it's gonna be fun for people to, when they're forming their own party and getting their friends together to be like, hey, what would our ideal superhero team be? Let's play these established characters or let's create our own and, and create a new team of heroes to destroy New York in, in, in the course of our misadventures. Yeah. So how did you strike that balance? And when you were seeing the play test play out, how did people uh, what did what, what did you think people gravitated towards initially? Cool. No, I, I, I was going to say it's it's funny because uh, we do feel that there's a, a pretty even split between folks that are very excited about creating their own superheroes. I mean, who doesn't want to make their own Marvel superhero? Uh, and folks that want to play established heroes as well. Uh, if, if folks sit down, let's say the three of us were going to go on an adventure, I, it's, it's really awesome that Matt can play as Spider-Man and I can play as my own created hero, but in our multiverse that we're playing in, this is a team that, that could exist because there's infinite multiverses as we know. So uh, in terms of striking the balance, we just, again, we wanted folks to, to feel like uh, they were in a sandbox. We, we wanted to try to give folks all the tools they could to invent the, the coolest stories possible. Uh, so when they are going on that adventure, uh, it's, it's, it's fun and it's unique to them. Yeah. From, from a design point of view, it was actually pretty challenging because we, uh, we had to come up with a system where people could build all sorts of different heroes, and we had to make sure that we could build all the Marvel heroes with the same system. It would have been very easy to just say, no, we're just doing Marvel heroes, handing the tablets down from the mountain saying, this is what they look like. You figure it out from there, right? But we actually had to build a system that was robust enough that we could jam all that stuff into it. And it worked out really well. One of the, ba the best things we did, though, was the public play test, right? We did a, a play test booklet that came out in April. That was like $10 last year, April. Uh, and it was 120 pages, and it was a really rough version of the game. It was too complex, and it was a lot of breaking points, but the neat thing about that is we had tens of thousands of respondees, players, who went out there and actually played the game and showed us how it broke, and we kept updating and iterating and iterating, and now I'm really happy with what we have as a final result. And then how many uh, how many powers do we have in the core robot? I lost count. It's like it's <laughs> hundreds, right? I, mean, I don't even know. I mean, Amir, I think, counted it up at one point. He's one of our guys as well. He's fantastic. Can I ask you something really nerdy? Please. Oh, yes. Are you sure? <laughs> yes. Like, even by my standards? <clears throat> because you, you can't beat us. <laughs> <laughs> when you were creating the stats for the established heroes, how much debate, argument, fistfights, <laughs> like, broke out when you were comparing, say, the power levels of the Thing and the Hulk and Silver Surfer and whoever the else? The funniest part was the biggest argument I think we have is that we made I made Daredevil a rank two character. We have six we're, ranks we're, of power. We're not friends after that, yeah, by the way. This is the... <laughs> I, I saw that in the book. Yeah, no, and everybody's like, I'm like, guys, we have to show some rank two characters if you look at what he does here and what his powers are. And his, his powers are not really all that powerful. One of the coolest characters. I love Daredevil, right? But from a power point of view, sh strictly from that, we're like, I think he needs to be number two. I won the argument, but yeah, it was everybody's like, no, you just, it's that gut thing. You're like, no, Daredevil's too cool to be that low. Yeah. Right? You're like, well. <laughs> but I will say, in the rule book, it's kind of illustrated and you make your point well, where it's like, look, Daredevil is powerful enough to protect his neighborhood, yeah. whereas Spider-Man is powerful enough to potentially protect the entire city. So I think, I think it all works out. Obviously, the entire game is self-contained in this book. But do you have plans for expansions, source books to dive into other corners of the Marvel Universe? 
Yeah, we have, uh, we've announced three more books, right? So the first one coming up in November is The Cataclysm of Kang, which is a 256-page uh, uh, hardcover. They're all 256-page hardcovers. And this is a, uh, and it's got six adventures in it. They go from rank one through six, because we have six games, ranks in the game. And you could actually take your character, your original character, and make and do their origin story all the way up to being as powerful as Captain Marvel. Right, if you want to, or you can just play them separately. You can play them individually. This could take you a year to get through easy. It's a lot of stuff, right? And we had some great writers that worked on it with us. It was me. It was Lisa Teague, B. Dave Walters, uh, Jesse Scoble, and Devinder Thier. I think is how you pronounce his last name. But some great guys helping us out. Um, <clears throat> my son Marty actually writes most of the profiles for us. He's 24 years old. and He's kind of following my footsteps as the family profession, which is just drives me nuts. But <laughs> but he's great at it, which is the best part. I was like I was like really excited to see him do it. Um, so we have The Cataclysm of Kang, which is coming out. Then we have the X-Men Sourcebook, which I'm currently writing right now, which will be out in February, is what I believe. Okay. And the X-Men source book is going to be 1,200 pages, though, right? <laughs> That's the tr Honestly, we only have space for like, you know, 100, maybe 150 characters in it. We're like, God, we could write six books like this. You could fill up, you know, encyclopedias, bookshelves with all the different X-Men characters. So we have to be a little judicious about where we go. But, but that's actually one of the cool things about having a system where you can make up characters, because if we don't provide you with the official one and you need that character for your game, the narrator can just make them up. They can design them themselves, right? And then after that, we have the Spider-Verse source book coming out next summer. So I'm, I'm really excited about that one, too. Yeah, and, and again, we want folks to, to understand that this is a, a game that we're supporting internally. It's not a licensed product, right? This is actually being developed by the House of Ideas. So uh, you can grab the core rulebook, and, and if you're interested in the X-Men, which, I mean, who isn't? <laughs> you can grab the expansion book and, and just feel like you're, you're really diving into uh, that specific property that you love, and it just continues to grow on itself over time. Last question. As you were working on the game and working out the game mechanics, did you each have your own particular favorite character that you created as you were playing around with this? We did have a lot of calls where I talked about, this is, oh man, I'm, I, I, I talked about CJ Man. This is the worst name ever. I, I, it's, I should probably go back to the drawing board on that one. Uh, but he... <laughs> When we were talking about creating characters, we wanted people to have as much fun as possible. So I would try to think of the most ridiculous things that you could possibly do. So, um, you know, I would I would talk about what about the CJ man who's this massive, you know, eight foot tall, like rock like being, but his powers are he, you know, throws long range hot dogs at people to to do damage. And and I wanted to come up with the wackiest character ideas I could think of to show that, okay, if you wanted to go down that route of something that feels that it doesn't make sense, but you have fun playing, you can do that. Uh, but then obviously if you want to go down the route of, okay, I have a super powered uh, armored suit and I shoot blasters, that's also just as fun. Uh, and the game can support both. And we're really excited to, to see folks do that. I haven't actually created a whole lot of characters to play because I've been working on building characters for the game. There's one character in uh, the Cataclysm of Kang that I can't tell you about because it would be a huge Ooh. spoiler. But it was when we came up with that, I was like, oh, that's going to be so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and yet yeah, the big villain is just amazing. You're, you're, when you guys see it, you're like, well, this all sounds fantastic. <laughs> A fantastic feat, a fantastic success. <laughs> I, I don't want to go back to the fantastic failure on the dice roll. Uh, thank you both so much. I'm looking forward to playing the Marvel Multiverse RPG with my buddies. Fantastic. Thanks for having Thanks us. For us. Thanks for watching and or listening to this special edition of Marvel Standom. We'll be back soon with more of our coverage, as well as some fun book clubs with me and Joe George. Be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to us on YouTube at Den of Geek US. Check out our Twitch and TikTok at Den of Geek TV and our Twitter slash Instagram at Den of Geek. We're also on threads. Don't forget to check out our web home of denofgeek.com where you can find all our Marvel coverage and more. We also have a paranormal and horror pop culture show called Talking Strange, hosted by Aaron Sagers. Check that out if you're into the spooky and weird. Thanks once again to our sponsor eBay and thank you all for joining us today. Be good to each other and stay safe. Thank you for listening to Marvel Standom, produced by Andrew Halley, Kirsten Howard, and Joe George. Hosted by Kirsten Howard. Editing and graphics by Andrew Halley. Social media coordinator, Lee Parham. Additional artwork by Chloe Lewis. Production assistant, Michael R. Music licensed from Soundstripe.com. 
Marvel Standom is a production of the Den of Geek Network. For more information, visit denofgeek.com.